Tommy, after a week of gloating, I will take my L's. My cash app account balance is not looking good after Saturday night. There was a lot of outgoing cash to other Carolina grads and former Carolina players. Not great. Somebody uh, was a little too confident. Yeah. You know, here's the thing with my cash app balance. It fluctuates. That's just how it is. When you're someone who, you know, occasionally bets on Duke UNC and who quite frequently bets on the golf course, it, it happens. Good days and bad days. Good days and bad days. Welcome to the Old Man in the Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 108, The Exceteras with Kevin Durant and Eddie Gonzalez. Tommy, this is a special collab episode between The Exceteras, uh, you know, another Cadence 13 podcast. And of course, uh, Kevin Durant and Eddie host this wonderful podcast. And this might be our most high level basketball conversation we've had. I think so too. We, uh, we've been talking about doing this for a while. Schedule has been a little hectic. We finally got it done. And I think, uh, it was definitely worth it. And I think, you know, this went in a lot of directions that we didn't even necessarily expect going into the conversation, which is saying something. A couple of things to note. Uh, number one, um, I am recording this intro from some random room out in the Bay Area. I'm out here for a couple of days of production. Can't announce anything yet, but exciting stuff. And I forgot my podcasting equipment. So the the podcast episode itself has good audio. I know my audio sucks right now and I apologize. Uh, the other thing we should note is I was in New Orleans. Uh, you know, incredible basketball game Saturday night. Tons of credit, props to UNC. They got a bunch of pros on their team. Probably legitimately have... I mean, again, I don't want to leave anybody out. They legitimately have like five. They're starting five. He's going to play in the NBA at some point. I, you know, I don't know what kind of careers they're going to have, but they're a really good team, man. And uh, incredible game last night as well, Tommy. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, result aside, what was what were some of your takeaways from the atmosphere? Because uh, this is a once in a generation, you know, type game, type moment. Yeah, I, you know, I had played in the Georgia Dome and I played in the Alamo Dome in the final four and oh four, but it's just so strange <laughs> watching a basketball game in an arena that size. It that it is a little befuddling. And I you know, and I obviously as a shooter, the sight lines are just so different. Um the atmosphere was amazing. Uh, whatever the capacity for the stadium, it was sold out, uh, you know, and it was it was a great college basketball game and Obviously, I'm totally bummed that we didn't go out with Coach on top. And look, it hurts, Tommy. It hurts that we lost to Carolina tough. in his last game in Cameron and his last game of his career. It hurts. I'll admit it. It hurts. They're going to be talking a lot of shit for a long time, unfortunately. I think that this one will sting. It's a fact. It's a fact. Props to Carolina. Nothing but respect. Also, sh- shout out to Kansas. Yeah. From last night. That was a, that was a great game as well. You were joking about the about the how big the arena is it was funny or, or the stadium is it's funny when when um when what's his name stepped out of bounds <laughs> at the end of the game last night there were probably 50,000 people in the stadium who had no idea that it even happened you know because of how far away it I, was. I wonder to some degree if he stepped out of bounds I mean it was just so egregious that it, it you know the court awareness there I wonder if it had something to do with it being in a dome and just the sight lines like, it, it is a totally different experience all right let's get to our conversation with the Exeteras, Kevin Durant and Eddie Gonzalez. Let's go. How you guys living? I'm a shit. I'm great. I'm great. I'm living. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Finally got this crossover. Yeah. Yeah. Long time coming. Long time coming. So short backstory. When I when we start talking about doing this show, I sought out Tommy. It was like, hey, like, what the fuck is this about to be? And then Tommy essentially says, uh, you got KD. It doesn't. You're fine. <laughs> You'll be you cool just, from there. You just throw the ball up in the air and you get the fuck out of the way. <laughs> it's almost verbatim. Like it was probably yeah. that text in my phone. So no, happy to have cool. you guys. Been Kev- a fan of the show for. Kevin, and I was at the game on Sunday night with my seven year old Knox. We were we were sitting second row when when you uh, you know you got to twenty first. You passed Reggie. Congratulations, yeah, bro. It was it was a rough game for the Nets. Knox was trying to get your attention. I, I gave like a five minute soliloquy on the Uber ride over about Kevin. <laughs> I'm like, Knox, he's seven. I mean, just he's getting into basketball, but he's obsessed. And I'm like, all right, so number seven. 
for the Nets. This is who I want you to focus on. <laughs> so every time you did something, he was going nuts. It was it was a cool moment as a dad. So what's it like? I guess preparing to guard Kevin Durant for a week <laughs> because uh, it cannot be fun. It cannot be. I can't remember what our specific game plan is. I don't remember us doubling you a lot in that series. And also, we should clarify, like, like I'm not preparing to guard <laughs> Kevin Durant. <laughs> Matt, Matt Barnes was preparing to guard yeah. Kevin Durant. Um, actually, truthfully, one of my career highlights, and I mean this sincerely, on the defensive end was your first year in Golden State. And we were playing in L.A. I was still with the Clippers. And you isoed me on the right wing in front of our bench and you know, give me a little shimmy and you went baseline and I stripped you going up the ball went out, out of bounds off you and I was like I fucking gotta stop on KD I gotta <laughs> stop on KD crazy. I was fucking pissed <laughs> you let this guy strip the only you? time I get an ISO on JJ I fucking let it go out Wait, of bounds off what, the leg Kev what'd you think about those old Clipper teams cause when we had we had Draymond on a couple months ago and he was talking he was he, he did what, not what, think what, highly of you guys what did he say he did your front runners <laughs> Didn't y'all beat them though before Steve Curry got there? Got there. We we beat them to play y'all in fourteen. It was a seven yep, game series, yep. and that was in the middle of the Donald Sterling thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that happened right after yep. uh, we had won Game Three, and we were still in San Fran. But I that series, that. so we played y'all in the second round in in two thousand fourteen. That series was very competitive. Two two. We're in OKC for Game Five. We're up eleven. We're playing horrible with a little over four minutes to go, mm -hmm. and we just have. An uber meltdown. Yeah, that, I mean, it was, I mean, because we were, we we're looking at the clock and we weren't making any shots that whole game. I probably was like six for like 22. We couldn't make threes. It was one of those games. But we got like a steal here, fast break, break layup. We just scored quick and then CP had a turnover. It's probably the play that the series is most known for is that CP turnover in the backcourt. Well, right before that, I think that was when you hit the three yeah. off the inbounds. I had hit a three over, yeah, on the right wing. Wild ass three too, right? Yeah. Yes, but it was quick too, yeah. and we're like we were at the point. It was similar. It, honestly, I fucking hate saying this, but it was similar to like a college team trying to run the clock. Yeah, out. that's yeah. how we handled those last four minutes yeah. of the game. Yeah. So all we're thinking about is like, let's run the clock out. Let's run the clock out, and they take the ball out of bounds, and Kevin hits a three off the inbounds mm -hmm. over. I can't remember he hit it over, but it, it was, was baby. It was uh, big baby and yeah. um, and Matt Barnes. They were both trailing. I was damn near open. I'm like, damn, that's a good look. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that cut it fast. And then, and then, so then CP tries to get a three point shot just behind half court because Russ went to go yeah. foul him, which was a ridiculous decision. Yeah, because all he had to do was just dribble. just dribble one more yeah. time. And he was going to foul him. Mm -hmm. And then the ball went out of bounds off Reggie Jackson. They gave you guys the ball anyways, even though <laughs> Reggie should have dropped that off to Pat, Kevin. Pat, Kevin, can we admit now? That I don't. I don't believe it went out on Reggie, <laughs> but I do think he should have passed that ball back to one of us. Okay, all right. And then and then and then CP fouled Russ on a three, oh, which man. I don't know why you're fouling Russ on a three, which was a crazy attempt. When he pulled up for that, I was like, Whoa. yeah. <laughs> and then for him to foul him, I was like, I can't believe CP made. These bad decisions, these two bad decisions this late. The game was in hand. I had that one. That was the lowest. And I, we went through some lows with the Clippers. You know, him getting hurt in the playoffs yeah. a couple times. That meltdown we had in 15 against Houston where we're up 3-1. Mm -hmm. I remember that, dude, that locker room in game seven in Houston after that game. I remember that. But that bus ride to the airport, that was as low as I've ever seen CP. That, that game – just was, that was fucking a, demoralizing. But you don't remember we had y'all up two in game four, was it? We supposed to be up 3-1 coming yeah. back to OKC. We up 20 points in like the fourth quarter. No, 16, 17 points in the fourth quarter. Darren Collison. Darren, Coll a, Darren uh, Collison. He had a won quarter. Won the game. Won mm -hmm. the game. That plane ride back was so – that was probably the lowest point I, I, I had with the Thunder. Yeah. Man, because we had the series. like They had beat us game one at home, so we had to go on the road, and we went two on the road. I'm like, shit, that's our series. Mm -hmm. Now it's 2-2 two, two coming back home. They got some momentum. And then they came out hot. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just it, – it just turned so fast. A series can turn so fast, and then shit, game five happened. Do you think, do you think that was your first, <laughs> your first experience with just like the high-low swings of the playoffs? Yeah, yeah because – we were expected to do big things that year. I felt like the years before, um, you know, 2011, 12, 13, 
we weren't expected to like go to the finals. You know what I'm saying? So now we at a, a level now where team, you know, the expectation for us in the locker room and people around OKC is for us to win a championship. So for us to lose in the second round like that, being up 20 to yeah, that was like that was real ebb and flow of a series I really felt that for the first time and. Against the Clippers, it was just like, I hated the fucking Clippers. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everybody did. That was just. You well, asked everybody, everybody to the did league. hate us. Yeah, right. I, think it, I think honestly it was because of what Draymond said. He was right. We were front runners. We were front runners. It, when things were going well, it was, it was. We were very loud about it, was it hard when things to were going well. With. It was hard to. Because y'all would kick our ass. Yeah. Like 2000, when y'all first got together, 2012. I think CP went. Uh, 2012, yeah, because yeah, he was there two years before I got there, so he oh, went he right after the there lockout. In 2012, that was Randy Foy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then the next Butler. year, those were the Vinny years, and then Doc and I came the same Vinny summer years. in 13. Yeah, the Vinny years, they when they first got together, I mean, they were playing so fast, and they beat us by 20 points every game in the regular season, and you heard it. I seen Blake. I, I want to say his rookie year. Well, I guess is it technically his rookie year? He missed his first year, but whatever it was, the first year he really hit the scene. Uh, I seen him in Sacramento, and it was like it felt like a megastar was there. Cause everybody just wanted to see him dunk in any time in the any tip, any you know it might look like a leak out. You could just feel the energy of just the crowd getting ready. You There's just, a little bit of Zion there, yeah. Like you know what I mean in terms of how they came out, and obviously Blake developed into mm -hmm. incredibly an incredibly skilled player, passer, shooter, mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, Zion is incredibly skilled as well in terms of his handling, his passing ability. He hasn't developed a shot yet, but that anticipation, yes, that excitement around like a single play in a game, yeah. That, those those dunks that Blake had early in his career, they're like seared in every basketball fan's memory. It's ridiculous, and it's a, it came to a point where even when he got into a pick and roll, you can see people start to like, yeah, because you knew CP they might double and CP drop it off. Once he gets to the launching pad, it was like <laughs> people were expecting that at a certain point. Do you think Blake would have been better as a five? Ooh. Probably. I just don't know, like, defensively, when it came down to it, if that's going to if that's gonna win you games in the playoffs. And that's the, I'm not saying Blake in his early in his career was bad defensively. I just don't know. And it, the league was different back then, too. I just don't know if, as a five, it would have worked. Was but it, I, my, 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 thing with, my thing with that Clippers team was, like, had we just been a step ahead of the rest of the NBA – in terms of playing small. And maybe it wouldn't have worked like with Blake and DJ being the four and the five. But if we had figured out a way to like play three and D guys, and by the way, I could play a little bit of defense early in my <laughs> career, bro. I'm just saying, but, but around CP and a Blake pick and roll with shooters, around CP and DJ pick and roll with shooters, I, I, think, I think we, even though we had great offenses, we had great offenses, but I think it would have been even better in the playoffs. It's kind of crazy. It's recent as those teams were to to think of a Blake and a DeAndre playing in the same offense. We never see that today. No. And if we, well, you know, I, I won't say that because there are some teams that are playing a lot bigger and, and sizing up now. The Cavs do it, and the uh, Celtics do it, and, and guys are they're doing that, and, and it's helping them on defense in different ways and stuff. But it, it it would look so foreign if we went back and looked at it. You know, uh, even two bigs playing high low, or you know, it's like. Like a it, Saul and Zebo type yeah, of combo. It's like fascinating that that was that recent. I mean, we're talking eight years ago. They're still doing it. Yeah, and I and, and I feel like there's no going back either. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. Like, I don't, I don't know if there will be a team that says, "Oh, now we're gonna we're gonna buck the trend, and we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna play a bunch like we're gonna go back to like a grit and grind." Like, you need space. That yeah. is the NBA. It's all about space. The That's power cool. forward's never coming back. No. The tradition. Bro, I had this tweet the other day. Some knucklehead said, if NBA teams played defense as hard as college kids, I bet you the scores would be in the 70s and 80s too. First of all, I mean, it's just math. First of all, the shot clock's <laughs> longer. So there's going to be more possessions in an NBA game. And there's eight more minutes of basketball. So fuckhead, that's not possible. <laughs> but secondly, what he doesn't understand is you watch college basketball, man. I'm like, these guys have not evolved their philosophy since the 1980s or 1990s. Same it's sets, ridiculous. Yeah. Same sets, same sets that I used to run, that I used to watch growing up, that Kansas used to run. Yeah. I'm like, 
bro, do you know why it's so hard to play defense in the NBA? It's not because we can't, and it's not because we don't try. <laughs> it's because there's fucking space, and the players are so good. <laughs> it's because they're guarding you. <laughs> right. <laughs> It doesn't matter what we do to him. He's the just, best he's still make it. fucking athletes. In a, you think somebody's just going to guard up and hold a team of 70 points that has fucking <laughs> a 30-point score on? Like, come on, man. No. Did I wanna, you, I, Kevin, I want to go back to something you said earlier about that little run. So you guys, I think the first year you made the playoffs was 2010. Yeah. And then in 12, obviously, you guys made the finals a little bit of a surprise run. Maybe not to you, but to certainly the basketball world. And then you guys traded James. Yeah. What was what was going through your mind when that trade went down? <laughs> you, don't, don't get canceled. Don't get in trouble. See, yeah, you gotta, you gotta <laughs> Kevin, realize, this is a podcast, man. We got to yeah, be honest point, on podcasts. At that point, like, I wasn't really – hip to the business side of it. Like, I wasn't really locked in with the front office to like, yo, like, let's have a conversation about our team going forward. So this kind of, the, the talks hit me out of nowhere. So I didn't really know how to deal with it at that point. So it was just like, I'm just focused on doing my job. Like, whoever come in here to play, like, it's cool. Like, we had a good run. We still got good players. And, you know, if it works for both sides, then let's just do it. You know what I'm saying? But, then you see, because James came off the bench for us, and then you you see how he plays as a starter. It was just like, hold up, <laughs> now was that a good that was was that a good move? To, yeah. You know, four or five years later, it was just like even that next fuck the first game, yeah, what thirty seven, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thirty five and ten, twelve, like and what? winning games is just. That was one of like the first NBA Twitter moments where yeah. it was like everybody who was league pass locked in. It's like, oh shit, they yeah, might have they might have fucked up. Everybody felt like everybody's watching the game. So in, so in the moment, it was like, all right, let's just move on and you know, I'll, we'll focus on who we have here. So like, like a few days but, before the season too, right? Where yeah, this goes in, yeah, yeah exactly. it all happened quick. It was like they all, they, they were negotiating his his rookie extension. Mm -hmm. They I think they got up to fifty million, and he wanted the five year eighty million, you know, eighty million dollar mm -hmm. max. Houston gave it to him. Pretty much on the flight, to right? Houston. Great investment. But, so, are you saying that that, 20, that 2022 Kevin, you feel like if if it had been different, if if you had existed in that space, then you would have just gone to the ownership and said, "You got to pay the luxury tax. You got to yeah, keep us for together." For sure, for yeah. sure. You okay. just it was not that was not on your radar. Then. Yeah, it was just I didn't feel like I had that relationship with our GM to just walk in and have conversations like that. For one, um, you know, so I was just. I just had to be down with anything that they did. I mean, I didn't get the calls on, you know, this is who we looking at in free agency. It was just like, you know, whoever they sign is who we sign and we're going to play with. You know what I'm saying? So, at, you know, I'm 22, year, 23 years old. So it was like that wasn't even in my thought process to ask or demand anything from the front office. So when did that when did that click, though? 16? That's, yeah. That started for you in 16 when yeah. you started getting I, whatever you just – I don't forget the word you said, a hip, hip to the business side or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I want to say, I mean, right after that 13, 14, I just wanted to know who was going to be on my team. You know, I wanted to know the guys that we were playing with. I seen the league start to change, so obviously we wanted more shooters around. We more, I wanted more skill on the team, you know, but I didn't have that relationship with Sam Presti in the front office. We were, you know, it was a good work relationship, but we didn't – go deep into the business. So as time went on, I just wanted to get more informed and on who was going to be on my team. And, you know, I started just digging into the business a little bit more. Yeah. You feel like that's the natural progression for like a star in the league? Like, or I don't know, the player empowerment era, like they say now, I feel like some guys show up now just demanding shit automatically. I mean, you don't know much coming into the league, but just playing, you know, so you just want to focus on your craft mm -hmm. and getting better and just, just hooping and, but now it's just everything's out there. The rumor mill is so easy to, you know, it's easy to see these trade rumors and easy to be involved in this shit now. So, you know, and these dudes, you coming in with a good relationship with your GM and your owner, you know, so you can have these you know, casual conversations about who's on the team. Yeah, I would say, yeah, you don't know until you know. So as a young player, you don't know until you go through it and you have those experiences. And, and one of the things that happens over time is when you are a superstar or you're a star player and then you're on a max deal, like if you're smart, 
you see how people treat you. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. I got a little juice here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to take advantage of this. <laughs> oh, I and got that's the- just, and that's, that's our league. That's yeah, our yeah. league. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's our league. Our league is like, historically speaking, you have to have a top five or a couple top 10 players to mm-hmm. win a championship. To be yeah. a great team, you need that. And so if you are one of those guys, it's like all of a sudden you're like, there's an aha moment where, yeah. oh, shit. And I, I didn't get that. Let's be it clear. would benefit a GM for you to bounce ideas off your best players. They mm-hmm. out there playing the game, so it's not a bad thing that they partnering up with you know some of those decisions on the roster. But do you think? But do you think that it's very different? When we're talking about you specifically, where from that point on, it was very clear that any GM owner, whatever, should be listening to you. Where it can become tricky is when guys think maybe they don't think they're you specifically, but they think they should have that relationship with organizations. And maybe they shouldn't. Like, maybe they're not good enough to deserve it. I mean, some organizations, I mean, some roles are different in organizations. Some players are. Are you talking about the Kings? (laughs) (laughs) You might be the number one guy on your team. You might demand that. You know what I'm saying? If you're the number one option on your team, you might get that. You know, each organization is different. So I want to, before we we get off the 2014 series, I always think about what you guys in that run, do you feel like, that was kind of your best shot at it. The Spurs, what did they do? The Spurs beat you guys in six, six. and that was. And then they beat the and then they beat the the Heat in five. In five, yeah. um, through the Heat, and they were like that was the bounce back year from them. For I don't think a team's ever been closer to losing the winning the finals than than losing it. But you guys, like yeah. at that moment, did you feel like that was it was coming together for you guys? Yeah, looking back, and, and I've talked about this with CP, and I've talked about this with Doc as well. I, I actually think that team was our best team, um, and we were really good in fifteen as well. Um, that team had depth, and you mentioned Derek Collison losing him, like he won us so many games yeah. that mm-hmm. season in the regular season, and mm-hmm. he won his playoff games too. We didn't have that depth that next year, um, and Austin got a lot better, but he was not. He was not ready to fulfill that role when he joined the team in 15. We used the mid-level on Spencer Hawes, and it was like an awkward fit, and he really didn't play a lot that year. So the one avenue we had to get depth was to use the mid-level to get a player, and Darren went to Sacramento for the mid-level, and we brought in Spencer because Doc was convinced we needed a backup big. And this goes back to our conversation. like The philosophy was different then. Mm. I mean, now if you had a chance to keep a guard who can guard multiple positions, break down a defense, and shoot forty percent from three for the mid level. I mean, <laughs> yeah, come on, <laughs> come on, <laughs> down there, Max for that. Yeah, but yeah, that was. I, I think that was our, our best team. And I'm not even saying, I'm not even saying that we would have beat the Spurs or we would have beat the Heat. I just think that was our best chance. Mm-hmm. That was our best chance that first year. Was 15? You lost. That's when you came. You lost three one lead. 15. We lost to Houston. I, I thought that that was your chance that yeah. year. Once the once the Warriors be, once the Warriors won once they broke through and won, those last two years were an exercise in futility. Like we really did. And then the third, the fourth, you know, the third year was their seventy three and nine year. The fourth year, Kevin went and then there. It was just like, all right, y'all wrap this shit up in LA. <laughs> Broke yeah, the right. league, ruined the league. Somebody, just, <laughs> somebody. T- I remember that that last season in LA. I, it was a. I think we played Houston, and it was like one of those games where. First half was fine. Second half, they got hot. We were trading We were trading twos for their threes. We ended up losing by 20. Body language got bad. And I remember reading this tweet after the game, and it was like, the Clippers are like a married couple waiting for their kids to go to college so they can <laughs> finally get a divorce. You know, And I, I'm like, yeah, I mean, that feels kind of right. That feels kind of right. You could see that on the court, like this weird tension. And so it always cracks me up. Like, you know, CP's done your pot a few times, and – to hear how tight you guys actually were. I think you did Matt as well and yeah. the same thing. It's just talked about how tight you guys were. And it's like, they didn't look tight. <laughs> I mean, they tight well, in a different way. Yeah, I mean. But look, I mean, the, you can be both though. Yeah, I mean, CP and I were always tight. Like, and But again, it goes, like I talk about this all the time. We CP and I talked about this on the podcast when he was on. But uh, you know this, like you if you if you recognize that a teammate of yours has the same agenda that you have, and that is just to go out and win basketball games by any means, <laughs> it's okay to cuss that teammate out. Yeah. I can motherfuck CP and we can go get a glass of wine and a, and a meal after the game. And mm-hmm. we can talk about our kids and family and life and basketball. And it doesn't, there's, it doesn't affect our relationship. Uh, he, he didn't have that relationship with everybody on the team. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and there was just, you know, this is, this is the NBA. You know, and, and I'll actually, this is a question I have for you because I think 
that Clippers team in some respects. I was looking the other day. There was one year where we had three All NBA guys. Mm-hmm. We were probably a super team. Like DeAndre all, Max contract and All NBA Blake Max contract All NBA CP Max contract All NBA. Mm-hmm. And I think the dynamic on super teams is really difficult. And you've done it now twice. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you just about the inherent challenges that exist on playing with on a super team. Not just the ego, because the ego is one thing, but roster building. Yeah. Uh, figuring out who's going to have the highest usage rate. I mean, shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you got, we had Golden State, you want to count Clay, like three guys that can create their own shots. When you got three guys that can do that, then you can pretty much pair them with anyone. On your team, you had two guys that had to be force fed baskets. You know, so the other guys may, you know, might be throwing off a rhythm sometime trying to get lobs or throw post ups. Whereas we can create nothing out of something pretty quickly, you know. So that played a factor into it. And when it comes to egos, we all were on the same page and just really wanting to win. I know it sounds simple, but like that's really what it was. Like every day is about, all right, how can we win this basketball game? Nothing else mattered. And when I got to Golden State, from the first to the Last guy thought that, but like from the owner to like the ball boy, they thought about that shit too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like in June, like everything was yeah. like in June, like at the parade, like it was just always, we was always talking about that, you know? So that shit matters too. Just that dialogue around the team, just that thought process of everybody, how you approaching every day has to be championship level mentality from the first to the last guy. Owner to the ball boy. Everybody got me thinking about it. And it was like that. And could you tell that from the jump? Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, the, when you lose like that in the finals. Yeah. Everybody came back hungry. Everybody wanted to just redeem themselves. It was just a it's it's a rare feeling to have in the league. Like the initial meeting. You you can sense it there. Oh yeah. 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 When they're there, right? I mean, so that knew, alone is like Yeah, I mean, we knew how you mean business. We knew, but the, you knew we knew how big that summer was with losing the lead, losing in the finals, and then me signing there. It was just so much noise around our team to start that season. We really locked in as a group. Now these super teams, they do seem to flame out like kind of infamously. Almost everyone, almost everyone we could think of, we can name even your guys' teams. Do you think that tension and that pressure of just you have to win a title or you failed? You think it's that? You think it's combination? I think more so the business gets in the way more so than anything. Yeah. We want to stay together as long as possible. Yeah. But mm-hmm. one guy might get paid for it. Yeah. yeah. One guy, Sean Livingston retired. Or I left in free agency. You know, so stuff like that happens more so than. I think there's a, I think you're right, though. I think there is a cycle to it. I think there's a cycle to it. And when you have, as I mentioned, when you have guys, the talent to win a championship, you have an obligation to go for it. And by going for it, you're sacrificing some future. Mm-hmm. You're, 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 you're trading your first round pick at the deadline nearly every <clears throat> fucking year to go get something. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, we did that every year with the Clippers. Yeah. You know, we, we did that every year. And, you know, like I said this a bunch uh, prior to the, the trade for James. I said, Philly to me is dumb to not do something with Ben because you have a window in the East. You have an MVP candidate in Joe. He's got an injury history. Like you have an obligation to go for it this year. Now I didn't know they were going to get James obviously, but like get two high level players. Yeah. Get a pick back, whatever it may be. Yeah. But like, you got to go for it. If you got the talent and that guy's healthy, you got to go for it. Do you guys feel like that's the best approach? I talked to people about like LeBron, he kind of moves in cycles. It's been four years, four years. This is year four now. And each of the last iterations, it kind of went like this. It's kind of flamed out. But you you do kind of owe it to the team. Like like the Rams, right? Fuck them picks. Yeah. Like we need now. I feel like when you have a, a player that's reached elite status in this game where he can just control the game, that's when you should go for it. You go for broke. When you got the top five player in the league, it's like, all right. I know I have something to lean on at the mm-hmm. end of games. Like, let's build around this. I mean, if you got, you know, you see potential in that, then you don't want to, you know, waste all your assets early on, a, you know, on trying to compete for a championship when your players, your best player is still developing. But once he gets to that elite status, then 
that's when you should go for it. This is this is also to me a very complicated issue that you can't necessarily point to one thing because whether it's player movement, uh, teams not being loyal, everybody's so hungry for a championship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the discourse around what is a successful season and an unsu- unsuccessful season for nearly every team now is about a championship or are we bottoming out to build for a championship? Mm-hmm. And so the life cycle of teams is, is inherently going to be shorter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The other part, I, I'll say this too, is you know historically, like we haven't seen a guy like LeBron play at this level you know, and move around. Yeah, and move move around, but also play at this level for this long. Yeah. So of course, there's going to be a life cycle to every team he's on. You know, and it, you know, he's not going to be in one place. There's no, there's no John Stockton, Carl Malone duo that exists anymore. Mm-hmm. There's no loyalty in this thing. Like I read something today when I was doing my notes, and it's like Dre talking about Kevin, go do what's happy. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Andre, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Kevin, go do what's happy. Do what's for you, and like that is the mindset of players now because we recognize yeah. what the fuck teams are going to do to us. Yes. There's no loyalty. Yes. There's a real turning point. I mean, everybody points back to LeBron's decision, but I think even back to what the Celtics did and, and KG kind of had to go through that and say, you know what, I got to just go for me. And, and it's other times in history, obviously, but there's definitely been a change in the guard in that sense. And it is kind of crazy. I, I I was curious about how players feel, and I think it does seem like a lot of you guys sit back and go, "Hey, you got to do what's best for you." I mean, you got on the podium with Kyrie did the same with the trade with James and said same thing. Hey, yeah, he has to go be happy, and we're, we're cool with that. And I think it's it's not lip service. It's 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 genuine. I mean, you got to put yourself in the best situation you feel can maximize what you're doing. You know, and I think everybody understands that now. You think? Do you ever have younger guys? hit you up asking for advice trying to figure this out because you've now been in this situation a lot <clears throat> yeah yeah for sure more so about um navigating through you know just life as a pro but knowing that they got that decision that's coming up uh, what they should what they should be looking for as it's coming up you know what was i looking for around that time you know being with an organization i was with a expansion team basically you know so i helped build the the foundation of that so for me to leave that you know that was interesting to a lot of young players you know since they you know drafted by organization expect to stay there you know so yeah they hit me up asking about what my thought process was throughout that situation and how i approach games stuff like that so it's good to have and i think that's better in our league now that we we got this open dialogue amongst each other and, we, you know, we bounce ideas off of each other as pros, and I'm sure that helps. Kevin, what was that What was that first year like for you? Knowing, getting drafted by Seattle, I think it was like two days before the first game, it basically comes out that they're yeah. going to try to relocate the team. <laughs> yeah. Like playing that season in Seattle, knowing there's a good chance you'd never play in Seattle again, not even knowing where you would play the next season, but you're still with the same franchise. That's got to be super yeah, fucking surreal. Wild. See, they told us that we'll be there for at least three to four years. So I settled in as if, you know, they'll make. A house. Yeah, I bought a house. <laughs> and Seattle's, I told my Seattle's mom, a I'm sick like. city, too. You would have had such a good time. Yo, there. me and Jeff was. I'm like, Jeff, I think I'm going to buy a house. He's like, nah, I'm going to just wait. I'm going to buy a condo downtown. I was like, you know, that's actually a better idea. My mom's are so like, yo, we should just buy a house. I'm like, nah, I think we might. <laughs> I don't know. So, but then it, the owner said we'd be here for three or four years. So I settled in a little bit. And towards the end of the year, we just kept hearing, like, hold up. I think they're making the change, you know, sooner than we thought. And I remember we were in San Antonio, probably a week left in the season. Um, Clay Bennett came out and, like, gave us three options of, like, cities that they were looking at, like San Jose, I think it was San Diego and then OKC. We was just like, all right, <laughs> you're from OKC. Like, we know what this is now. Like, so we know what this is. Around, around April is when I was like, all right, I'm, I'm moving in to OKC. It's got to be a while. Like, that three years in that in the row, right? You you moved to Texas, then you moved to Seattle. Yeah. Okay, like, it could not be much different dynamics yeah. in which you. I, I prepared to stay in Seattle for four to five years and then. I, I figured we'll move, but I, I, I didn't know it would be that soon. 
I want to talk about your guys' routines. I know this is something you've talked about a lot on your show, just your shooting routine when you were playing and how meticulous it has to be. And you're like a scientist with shooting. I've been watching him do his routine for a while now. And it's like, I wonder like when that stuff develops. And when you're 15, you're just shooting, right? <laughs> like, you know, but at some point you're a pro and you start put, putting together this workout that becomes your bread and butter. I used to love watching Kevin's pregame routine. I do too. All that, all that one leg pirouette spin. <laughs> the Dirk, it's a Dirk workout, yeah, right? That's where I stole it from. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Honestly, I actually did have a routine when I was a kid. Really? And I think for me, the routine, the work, like always trying, always trying to get better at something, always trying to master something that you could never master. That's kind of what I loved about basketball. So I always had a routine and then I got to college. <laughs> Then I got to college and I, I, I figured I'd want to be a frat kid for a couple years. <laughs> <laughs> so didn't have much of a routine there. Um, and then my junior year, like summer be before my junior year, they gave me a, a, a spreadsheet. I still have the spreadsheet. And it was uh, day by day, hour by hour, what I was doing. And, uh, and I lost a bunch of weight. I got in incredible shape. I won ACC Player of the Year. I won the Rep Award for National Player of the Year. And I'm like, oh, shit, like this is the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And for the rest of my career, it was like that. And I, I mean – you know, our production company is named 342 because every Sunday in the offseason, I go make 342 shots exactly. <laughs> so, like, I was very Why OCD that? about the routine. Why that number? You, it's easy. I, you, you'll get this. There's seven spots on the floor. I should make, tw I make 20 spot twos, shoot five free throws, 20 spot threes, shoot five free throws, three one dribbles going right, shoot five three thro free throws, sh three one dribbles going left, shoot five three throws. That's 342 shots. That's seven spots. That's How long would it take you to do that, Tommy? Uh, on a day? good day, it'd be about 35 minutes. I was say, For yeah. you? If I, yeah. That's a great With workout. With one rebounder. That yeah, sounds yeah. like a great workout. What, yeah. what, same guy rebounding and passing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was, but, that uh, was, that was, you said how often did you do that? Every Sunday in the off season. Every Sunday. Every, and then this, during the season, like, not not as much as, <laughs> late in my career just because my I, I had to preserve energy. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> there was times in, during the season I'd go to a half, I'd, I'd do half that. So, after so, practice? After practice, I had a routine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sh after shoot around, I had a routine. After uh after shoot after shoot around routine i had a routine like i had a routine on top of routines on top of routines my how game days were like to the minute he how loves long, this shit yeah he loves routines. i'm just interested how long <laughs> how long did you work out after practice after practice yeah not long 20 minutes it just spot shots you know what it was no I, I, movement I, I, yeah yeah especially my first 13 years yeah a lot of like all all the dho stuff yeah, yeah. pin down stuff um you know, sprinting in transition for transition threes. I worked on but, all that after yeah. practice. But this was a this was a big thing. I'm curious if this affected you at all. We talked about this all the time during COVID. Every, oh, this was a question yeah, I had for you. Everything yeah. else yeah. aside, all the other issues with COVID and like that, it's like everyone's routine is completely fucked. And so all of these different things you have, all of a sudden it gets thrown out the window and you're used to doing a certain thing that's worked for you for however many years and all of a sudden it's gone. Some guys can handle it better than others. Did with, you feel like your routine? Yeah, did you feel like your routine last year with, Got thrown off at all, especially coming back from a major injury. No, no. Nah. I mean, we mean routine. Like, is what we mean like what I do on the court. Yeah. No. Nah. Why would it change? But but did you have did you have because you had stuff like the pregame meal like oh yeah I mean I'm talking about like, just like on, the, on my back I still got my work in I'm yeah. talking about yeah, no. my day got just disrupted day. so He's many like fucking times I'm eating lunch and if I don't eat lunch yeah, at two yeah. fifteen and it's like I get to I day. you know then you had to like you couldn't see I didn't have a routine like that it was just when I got on the court it's just I just wing it outside of that. Oh, but the so arena, would you? That's lucky. Some days that made nap. That's some days that made. Yeah. Oh no no no! Oh, but when you clock in, it's but, but you it's I, all day. It's the oh, whole it's game days. It's 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 would, like as soon as I wake up, <laughs> the routine freak, starts. You freak out about the it. routine starts all the way to the post game. Twelve minutes and twenty five seconds in the in the cold tub. I was I actually. Would, I would do like I would time it like twelve minutes and twenty five seconds because I'm a, such a sicko that they were like, yeah, <laughs> do it for twelve minutes. So I'm like, okay, I'll do it for twelve minutes. But then sometimes I'd get in and I would be like. Oh man, I started my timer a few seconds too early. I'm cheating myself. So just to be safe, <laughs> I'm gonna do 12, 12 minutes and twenty five seconds. Oh, so you're a sicko. Yeah, you're you're a you are. That's why you're a sniper like yeah. that. Yeah. I was about to say, like, I feel like that's probably the same part of your brain is just being obsessive with your shooting and being a great shooter, which you are. I think I think to be a great any shooter, any skill, to be great at any skill that requires uh, hand-eye coordination, like you have to be. It, there's a there's a level of obsession. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I feel like when I just walk into any gym and I pick up any basketball and I just flick it at the rim, I could just – it's not even a workout. I'm just – I feel like that's adding to me perfecting the skill of shooting. The even if it's just time. like at an AU and game and you're, flops and and you're just, just – Yeah, it's part of the – It's the, part of the whole Part thing. of the work, part of the build. Yeah, because it's all touch at the end of the day. Do you, muscle memory. Do you, do you feel like you've mastered basketball? <laughs> I'm serious. I have a follow up. You're the person like, I have, to ask. I have a follow up to this question. <laughs> but yeah, get to this. I, I master who I want to be out there. Okay. And that that's a so uh, I cast a pretty wide net. Yeah. You know, when I play, you know. So we so did I master me, yeah. We did an app a couple weeks ago with Luca and we were talking to him about like who he likes to watch and he said you and he basically to, to paraphrase what he was saying, he was like, It's not fair how easy it is for him. To especially talk about scoring, but really everything. Can you set? Can you feel that like not like jealousy, but you know what I mean? Can you feel like other guy? Like is it? Can you feel their frustration a little bit about like you can do these things that they they would have to work you know months, years, whatever it is to figure out how to do, and this is just a thing you can just pick up just like that. I used to feel that. I used to feel that five or six years ago. It used to come from big men who can't dribble or run. <laughs> and I used to feel just a little slight animosity towards what I was doing. But at this point now, it's been more so respect. But yeah, I felt that before. That's I, the- it's, it's funny. I Early on, and so in, in a couple of my ESPN hits, like back in November, I, I remember I, I said something along the lines that we were talking about best players in the league or MVP. You know, it was some dumb, dumb debate we were doing. And I was like, uh, I was like, players. We, we we sometimes we're like, we put Kevin over here, and then we're, we it's compare everybody else, <laughs> you know. And like, so I made a comment one time, and I was like, and obviously Kevin's the best player in the world. And then we started talking about, and like, I, I don't mean like MVP. <laughs> like MVP year to year is going to change. And we we can talk about MVP for yeah. this year. Like I, yeah. I think it's a fascinating conversation. But I'm like, Kevin is the best player in the world. There's no one that can do what Kevin does. And then like LeBron's maybe the greatest player ever, but Kevin, like he's the best player in the world. And I like went on my Twitter account afterwards and I was like, oh God. Because it was like <laughs> it was like Steph stands, Lucas stands, yeah, LeBron yeah. stands, everybody coming from my head. Yeah. But I think as players, when I have conversations with players throughout my career, you know, last 10 years basically, it's like, oh, who's the best player? Oh, well, Kevin's the best player. No one can do what Kevin does. Yeah. I f- I f- yeah, I feel like um I feel like the style of play is uh it's just unique. Just you know how I approach the game, trying to score. Like it's just when I, I don't force it. That's the thing. So it, it looks natural. You know what's funny? My observation the other night, and again, I, I mean, I'm I'm hyping you up to Knox, and you took 24 shots that night, and I saw the box score after the game. I'm like, Kevin took 24 shots. <laughs> Like I don't know if I took twenty four shots, maybe maybe once in my career, and like he, there was not a four shot. I remember there was a fast break in the second half. It was like a two on one, and I'm you had a head of steam on the defender, and I'm like, oh, Kevin's just gonna jump, try to draw a foul, score, and like he made the right pass. He threw a bounce pass to the other. I think it was Bruce. He threw a bounce pass to Bruce. Bruce ended up fumbling or whatever, but I'm like, Kevin made the right play. Like that was my takeaway from that watching that. Yeah. You know, in person, I watch maybe NBA every night, but like in person, you, you, you're not looking at your phone. I'm not looking at other box scores. I'm watching the game. And yeah. like, I, I, that was the whole time. That's what I'm thinking. Like, Kevin just, he plays the game the right way. When did that click for you? Because that, that is not something you had when you were 18, 19 years old. Like, that is something that is developed. That is <laughs> knowledge that gets passed yeah. down year to year. When I got to college, I learned how to watch film. Coach Barnes taught me what to look for when I'm when I get the ball, and it and it grew from there. Once I got more opportunities to handle the ball out on the perimeter, 2013, I started watching film, seeing film, seeing things in film a little different. Openings that may happen before I see it, or where a guy should be in the offense, um, you know. And I understood that at any time, like I can raise up and take a shot. So knowing that I got that in my back pocket is fun. Like, all right, you open, like, you got it going tonight, let me see. You know, it's, it's knowing that I can pass first and then score whenever late in the clock if I need to. It keeps my teammates involved. 
Is there ever a temptation, a little fucking, I don't know if it's a devil on your, on your shoulder or a voice in your head that is just like, nah, just shoot over everybody every time down the floor, like go, like go into God <laughs> no, mode. No, nah, see, a lot of people <laughs> ask why I don't get 60, 70 point games. This is me on the way to the game. <laughs> shoot 40 <laughs> times. I to break it down to people. It's like when I watch these dudes get 60 and 70, it's like the, the, the adjustments don't change from the, from the opposing coach. If I come off a pick and roll and you want to drop the first play of the game and I switch the shot, you probably gonna make an adjustment. So I can't I can't come off and get free looks anymore off a of pick and roll. So if I come off a pin down, if I get a wild if, if if I come off a wide open pin down, what you think your coach is gonna say if I make a three the first quarter, make an adjustment? So it's like it, the little sh- it takes a lot for somebody to score big seven fifteen to sixteen free throws, wide open three pointers. Like I'm not getting those looks your whistle's crazy too <laughs> you know what i'm saying so shooting over two people it's hard to get 60 <laughs> points <laughs> 50 points consist you know shooting over two people so i gotta play with adjustments from the opposing coach in game like he don't wait till after the game and say damn we should have trapped kd right there he gave a 60 no nah, it's just they make adjustments on me so take the take the number of points out for a second i wanted to ask you about the the game five in the Milwaukee series last year, not even game seven. Yeah. Cause that was pretty close to God mode in the playoffs yeah. where they, they knew what was coming every time down. It didn't really matter. Is that a point where it's like, you're in the, you're in the playoffs and the flip switch is just the switch flips. And you're just like, fuck it. I'm going to do what I need to do. I mean, well, in that game, I felt like their whole plan was like, well, Katie can't beat us by himself. So yeah. Let him just go crazy. We're going to lock everybody else up. So they were a little loose on their coverages. Left me one-on-one sometimes. They planned and dropped the whole game. It was just like, well, I mean, I, was, <laughs> I made 17 of my 23 shots because I just felt like it was a regular season game as far as the coverage on defense. And then they ramped it up a bit after that, but – I felt like they underestimated us that game. Statistically, that's like one of the best playoff games ever. I think. I, I, and I'm that. still pissed that I missed that free throw to get 50. <laughs> it was like wide left, and it, I was just so hot because I should have – the 50, 17, and 10 just looked way better than 49. Sitting, was, yeah. I was sitting with my boy, you know him, Alan Yang, for that game, and we were like, fuck, he scored 55, and then you break it. It's like – that shit pissed me 50, off. 70, what? what You're right about that. It was and that nice. game was huge for me because – when you have an Achilles injury, like, I had somewhat of a doubt, like, of my abilities, my physical abilities. So, like, I wanted to test to see, like, that's the best team that we're going to play. And playing 48 minutes is, like, that's the ultimate test to see what my body is. So, for me to get through that game and the way I did it, it was just, like, a huge milestone for me. You did know you, what I'm saying? Was there any point in that game where it's like, oh, I got to get a blow? That's kind of nah. because I was just no so in it. Yeah, I was just so in that game seven though. That game seven, I was, I was, I was gas. That extra five minutes, it was, was a lot. To a point where I just, I just, I was, I didn't know where I was one time. Like <laughs> <laughs> I, was running, I was running back down court, and I was just such in the days. Like I just felt like, mm. like hold on, what the. F- <laughs> and I never felt that in a game before, and I was just like, "Hold on, I may need a break." <laughs> you know, what I mean, he called time out right after that. Did you think the uh, the three win? Did you, did you think your foot was in the line? Yeah, I knew it was. It's weird that you can feel that type of stuff. The clock running down, or like your foot on the line. Like it just it just felt like yeah. I, I, as soon as I stepped on it, I'm like, "Damn, I knew that." Sh- it's like a shooter thing. Thing. You can feel no, the line. No, it's it, but it's like it's like court awareness. Yeah, because we were having a discussion earlier about. Um, the Brady Manic elbow against yeah. Baylor. And mm. we were talking about when you get to a certain level of basketball, you know you just, instinct, instinctively yeah. where everybody is on the court. And you know where you – like there were times where I'd run for like a transition corner three and I knew that I had stepped out of bounds before the yeah. ref yeah. blew his whistle. Yeah. 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 You just you just know. Like just being you on the court it. for so long, you know every angle. You just know every crack and crevice of the – you just know it. It was it – was, Blatantly obvious by by Game Seven that Milwaukee's plan was basically you know we're like KD can't beat us and he fucking nearly <laughs> did. Just let him die out there. Man. He can't beat us alone. He nearly it's also did. Just, it was also funny. I mean, we we've had Drew on a couple of times since that series, and this is a guy we've talked about with you. We've talked about with a million people on the show. Arguably, you know, one of the best defensive players in the league, and he was saying about you. He's like. 
I think he literally said that we we're like, how do you defend Kevin? He's like, you just play defense and then you just pray. You just like hope it doesn't go in. I've seen that. I've seen he said There's like that. nothing else you can do. <laughs> and so it's like against guys like that of all people, it's not like these are guys who don't know how to play defense. I mean, they definitely. I mean, Drew Holler is tough to score on, though. You know what I'm saying? He definitely makes every attempt tough. When guys are physical, is you got to you know you got to dive a little deeper, use a little bit more energy, you know. Um, and that team was super physical with PJ. You switch off with Giannis and you switch off with Drew. So anywhere you went, you was finding you was going against somebody that was going to either body me up, ride me as I'm going to the rim. So I had to be on point. I always I always felt that way with Kobe. That was like I, I didn't guard you enough to feel that, mm. but like. I guard D Wade. I guard Manu. Yeah. You know, those were tough matchups. But like, I guard Kobe and I'd be like, he's either going to make or he's going to miss. Like, that's, that was my, like, I, I can make it hard on him, whatever yeah. the fuck that means. But like, ultimately, <laughs> Kobe's either going to make it or miss it. There wasn't a whole lot you could do. Yeah. Kobe had a, I want to say, 2008 to like 2013, it was no defense for him. Him, but to like once, yeah, help. before he before he tore yeah, his Achilles, like, yeah, 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 it's like extra help and uh, or just full out double. <laughs> but what I everybody always talks about you, and there's other guys that get mentioned in this sort of thing, but like everybody's always like KD, he's the definition of a hooper, and I'm like, what is what does that mean? Like, what is your definition? What does it mean to be a hooper? What's the difference between a hooper hoopers, like, and no? Nah, there's a difference though. Nah, man, we all spend time in gyms. That's what a hooper is to me. I spend a lot of time in the gym. Do you think there's a difference? Which one are you? I, I think I think there's a I think there's a love like a basketball player is a basketball player is someone that like a, a player in the NBA. There, you can be a basketball player and be like, oh, I'm good at this. And I can make money and I like everything that comes with it. A hooper is someone that like it is who in know. the gym at all time. Like who who yeah. likes being in the gym? Like non hoopers to me, just it's a job. It's just they only do it when there's time. How much do you, how, do you think that 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 the addiction to basketball extends off the court? Because I think it, like Jamal Crawford's a great example of this. Like Jamal, if he's not playing basketball, he's coaching his son in basketball. He's thinking about basketball. He's mm -hmm. watching basketball. Like. I think that it's a, it's a, being a hooper is to me is like your whole life is an extension of what happens on the court. Yeah. For sure. I mean, our lives are wrapped around this game since we was eight, nine years old every day and dedicated to playing. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's just taking on life of its own right now. But it's like, you know, we've been in school for this since we were kids. So it's like you got so much knowledge <laughs> and info. And so many other people love basketball. It's just hard to get away from it at this point. It's like you're always going to talk about it. It's always going to be on TV. It's the coolest thing now. Like it's 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 culturally cool, you know. So it's just it's it's just in our DNA at this point. When you play for this long, how many years you play in the league? Fifteen. Yeah. I mean, fifteen years of six months out of each year, you. Locked this is 15 for you, right? Because yeah. you came in a year after me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fourteen on the court. Yeah, right, right, right. Because I missed that year, but yeah. I mean, but 15 getting paid. 15 getting paid. <laughs> don't tell, don't tell, I'm not 14. I'm 15 years in. Yeah. Do you think uh, we we get in like to these discussions all the time, um, whether it's on Twitter, you know, I do it on ESPN all the time. We do it on the podcast, like comparing eras. But even in just your era, from when you came in the NBA – how much harder was it then to score 30 in a game than it, than it is now? It was so hard to score 30. Back then, I mean, you got two guys in the paint, and it wasn't exotic offenses like we got now, multiple exotic screens. <laughs> How many? Eddie and I were talking yesterday, and I was like, yo, Katie, we were like, Katie used to run Rip Hamilton yeah. floppy action his rookie year in Seattle. That's all, that's all they ran that for was you. The, everyone, that was the key play. And that, and that seemed like you just were – out of this world as an offense <laughs> if you were in a floppy. But now, you know, you got coaches dedicated to just finding trick pet plays to get you open and get you in space. But back then, it was like you had to kind of create your own space out of nothing. And the mid-range was key because you can't, you know, it wasn't a lot of threes being put up and the paint was clogged. So scoring 30, man, you had to make tough shots. 
back then. Now it's way easier. One, one of the fun things that happened in my career, and I feel like I came in the league probably like five or six years too soon, mm-hmm. is when I first came in the league, if you were a great shooter, like you were shooting spot threes. Yeah. You were waiting on a double team in the post or someone, the low man to come over and the swing, swing to the corner. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, people were like, oh, wait a minute. This guy, he shoots 40% from three. He's shooting three or four a game. If we can get up to eight a game, like our offensive efficiency goes way up. So the creativeness, and Duncan Robinson is a great example. It's like the the sets they used to get him open was swell. The sets Doc used for me, the sets Brett Brown used for me, like Mm. that was fun to me. And you talk about like the the exotic offenses, like the counter to the counter to yes. the counter. Like these things are in the scattering report. We got to counter for that yes, to get exactly. an open three. Exactly. I mean, having shooters that can run off the screens and shoot the ball quick, that's a supreme skill. And it's, you have to have that if you want to have an exotic offense. Like it's built around guys like that. You see Steph Clay. You even see, like, we played Ben McLemore in last week. <laughs> yeah. This guy had five threes in the first half, but all of them was off of pet plays, fades to the corner, double screen on the baseline. He coming off shooting quick. So it's like anybody could get hot on you in the league and beat you. It's like any given Sunday now with the three-point line and the way they run their sets for threes. To, to that point, though, sorry, sorry, but to that point, while it's – it's like it's it's hard. It was harder to score back then. It's easier to score now. Some of that is well as well to me is I think the talent pool. Oh, I'm yeah. not saying that the great players now are better than the great players 20 years ago. I'm saying there's more great players now. Yeah, I mm-hmm. believe so too. Than there were in ter- talent. Yeah, than there were I mean, 20, look, 30 years ago. You look at the centers now. Most of them can shoot threes. Take the ball off the dribble. Yeah. Make a bounce pass. Just got you know got some skill for offense. Not a lot of back to the basket bigs, old power fours in our league. So, and that's the that's what really changed the league. To be honest, I think Draymond had a huge played a huge part in shifting that with being a four man that can guard fives mm-hmm. and being able to dribble and play so fast. Kind of took out that traditional big that just like like the you know sit in the paint. I didn't tell Draymond this because I didn't want to offend him. But when we had him on the podcast, I wanted to tell him this. But I remember there was a moment. I think it was his second year, but it was my first year with the Clippers. And we were playing late in the season. I was I missed a bunch of games that year with my, my back injury. And we were playing late in the, se- in the regular season. And he was in the game in like the second or third quarter. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what does he do? Because back, <laughs> no, like back then, back then, like it, every, you know, it's like you got to do one thing great. Yeah. You know? I'm like, what does he do? Like, and I said, I, th- I, I was fucking horribly wrong on this take, but I was like, man, he's. He's the worst rotation player in the league. Like he doesn't do anything <laughs> oh, great. But it was different back then. The philosophy was yeah. like Swiss Army guys, and then and obviously Draymond became you know through experience and obviously his natural intellect. Yeah. But he became one of the smartest basketball players ever. I didn't know he had that. Of course, yeah. I mean, we he even would tell you that he came in didn't know he didn't even know how he wanted to play because well, he was, was his just, identity. Like what's yeah, my identity? He was playing a three. He was playing some four mm-hmm. sometimes, but he was mainly a wing player with Mark Jackson. He was coming into the games to provide def- a defensive presence on, presence on the wing players. He wasn't really playing this Draymond role that he is now. But once he got moved to playing a small ball four and five, then I think that's when the league took off and you've seen way more skill from top to bottom in your lineup. You look at teams like Toronto, they're just loading up on 6'8", 6'9", 6'10". Hopefully you can guard all of this. And that's – that's like the counter to a guy like you, like yeah. you know, and and then you look at college, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And you guys, they're, they're looking for six, six ten, seven yeah. foot guards essentially now. I, I mean, that's my theory on the, where basketball will go in the future. It's gonna be nothing but six nines up and down the board from point guard to center. And it's just that French kid, Victor. Yeah, it's just, oh, he's yeah, yeah. he's like make believe, but that's what. They look. That's like a, the future yeah. of basketball. Yeah. Length, athleticism, skill. Kevin's talking about himself. <laughs> like, I'm talking the about the future Kevin. of basketball. <laughs> the future of basketball. Wing is a bunch play. of bees running around. Do you feel that though? Like, are you aware of that? You I mean, you understand that impact? Look at the Clippers. They just spamming wing players. Look at Toronto. Like you said, everybody's just one wing player. That's just Boston. I just happen to be a wing player. You yeah, know, yeah, but yeah. like you got guys that can guard one through five now. I mean, when you got you know. 
stretch bigs. You can six nine guy can guard us. How about big. how about the 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 short lived era of the stretch four? Think about that. There's no such thing as a stretch four anymore. Yeah, like the you have to be high, like the those yeah. type of guys. You got to be. You got either got to be a center or you got to be able to handle and guard one through four. Mm-hmm. Like you, like I'm not gonna name names, but like why not? Because like most of them are my friends because I play with them I mean, in Orlando. Been <laughs> it's easier than that. <laughs> <laughs> we invented the stretch four. <laughs> no, but it's Shout like the, short. It's just it's, it's, it's like that. That it was like a like a I don't know eight year. Like oh eight oh nine to yeah. like seventeen eighteen, and all of a sudden it was like, oh no, we could just put Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown at yeah, three and the four, and we're guys, good. Yeah, yeah. It, that you, Orlando team was revolutionary yeah, too in that same way. That team, yeah. I mean, do you, you think that team was like, yeah, a huge part of what's like, going on now? For this this like era, right? To me, it started with Phoenix. Mm. It started mm-hmm. with the seven seconds or less. Steve Nash, D'Antoni Sons, where they're chucking threes. And 05, even, 06, Phoenix teams. 04, yeah, think, 05, yeah, yeah, 04, 05, 05, 05, 06. Yeah, yeah, it started then. Playing our, a Mario our shit, our shit was an accident. Boris. Because uh, in preseason, uh, uh, Tony Batie hurt his shoulder guarding Dwight in a preseason workout. And he mm. was going to start at the four. And Rashard was going to start at the three. And Turk was going to come off the bench. So then in preseason – Sort of by accident, they were like, all right, we got to go small. So they tried to play Turk at the four, and he was not having it. Because, <laughs> <was like>, <laughs> again, back then, he's guarding Zach Randolph. No, he's like, nah, 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 nah. This ain't I'm it. not doing this. Yeah. I'm not doing this. So Rashard, because he's a, he's a fucking pro, was like, yeah. I'll do it. And and yeah. all of a sudden, we just – we ran that offense. you know. And, and truthfully, like the first time I heard about analytics was with Stan. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. broke it down for us. He's like, "This is what a corner three is worth. This is what a layup is worth historically. This is what a mid range is worth. Here's what, here's what we want our shot profile to be." And if you look now, like we would have been bottom five in the league in three point attempts per game. But at the time, That's it high. was revolutionary yeah. to play four out, one in space and have you know space in the paint all the time, allowing Jameer to get downhill, allowing Turk to get downhill. Do you think Rashard turned into just a catch and shoot player though? Because I felt like in Seattle he would was more a problem on the block. Off the on a block, on the, off yeah, the yeah, dribble yeah, yeah. too. But I felt like when he got to Orlando, it was like just catch and shoots. Yeah, he was playing a role though because we put the ball in Turk's hands. Yeah, you know, and obviously Jameer had an All Star year. He yeah. probably could have been an All Star a couple more years. Mm-hmm. But Turk played such a role on those teams, and then to a degree, like Richard, just he was older at that time. You know, yeah, he, he was. was by the time we sort of ended that run in eleven, basically 11, 11, 12, Richard was well into his thirties at that time. Yeah. I think people forget how close that finals was. I know you, you were just talking about it with Powell. Like that it swung several times and could just have easy easily been two one you guys, maybe three one you guys and you know shit just broke. But that team was like what you guys did to the Cavs, like nobody expected yeah. that, you know. We, 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 that year, we kind of came out of nowhere, nowhere. Our 2010 team was actually better. We were deeper. Yeah, you, you, we, Vince we, on that team. Yeah, Vince was on that team. We, we were we were better that year. We just kind of we we tricked off. We had home court against the Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. We Remember tricked off the first two games, mm-hmm. and then we lost in six. I mean, they, we couldn't come back from that. That team was that team was too good. That Celtics team, but um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think to the I think year, I think. Right? What people Celtics, Celtics, what people yeah. tend to like overlook as time goes on is how much playoff series finals they swing on two plays, yeah. three plays. You know, you our series, our yeah. series against the Lakers was Courtney Lee's missed layup at the end of over or at the end of regulation uh, in Game Two. Mm-hmm. Us being up five in Game Four with under forty seconds to go, they come back and tie it. You know, we we missed free throws, we missed a pull up jumper. Derek Fisher hits a three. Mm-hmm. Last year's finals came down to two plays: Giannis's block, recovery block, and then and then Drew steal and and uh, and Giannis's dunk. Like it was it was two plays. So yeah. do, do, when your finals, because you guys beat the shit out of them the first <laughs> year, right? The first year was the four zero year, right? No, no, second year was second year was year. second year was four zero. Year, it was. Uh, we went up 2-0 at home, but game three, they had a chance to beat us. I think we were down most of that game to, like, the last minute. That's the Corver shot, right? That, that game? Yeah, if Corver would have hit that shot. That's right. They'd have went up five. He had an open corner three, and that would have sent us home. Then they had the most historic shooting <laughs> night in finals history of game four. So, who knows what that would have been like. 
two two going back to the bay, you know. But and then in twenty twelve, we uh, one game one at home. Game two, we are down big and end up having a shot to tie it with a the, couple seconds to go. I, I still should have made the shot. People say I got fouled, but I don't. I, I should have made it. I don't believe I got fouled. Thought it was a good. But look. that would have changed. I mean, we'd have been up two zero going to Miami, and that's when the it was two three two series two. So we played three straight games right. in Miami. Yeah, that was a – yeah. So it was – yeah, it could change in a matter of just one possession. Did you did you have any doubt in the Rockets series? And it's 18. The year where Chris got hurt. I knew that we can crawl out of that, but I, that was a tough position to be in. I can't lie, you know. Because <laughs> nothing, was, nothing was thinking, working. Yeah. Nothing was working. Like we – our pet plays, they were switching everything. Like literally every screen was a switch. And when you got a team that relies on movement, offense, passing the ball, when you switching every screen like that and force everybody to play one on one, we had guys that didn't naturally didn't score in the isolation situations. You know, Clay was solid, but he wasn't. He was used to coming off screens more so than anything and posting up guys. But off the dribble out at the three point line, he didn't really do that a lot. So me and Steph had to really play one on one that series, and we weren't the Warriors weren't really used to that. For four years, a team that schemed them that well, you know, so we that shit hit us like a a brick. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we figured it out after Tommy and then CP getting hurt. That was that helped us for sure, you know. But when a, when a team is melting down like that, you're conscious of it, and you're is it like yo, I gotta put the foot on the gas, or you just still doing your own shit? And in that series, yeah, in that game seven too, right? That's when they missed all the shots. Yeah, when we got down 15, we walked into that locker room, like, oh, shit, this can't be it. Like, we're losing. With OCP, we had big dreams of just destroy the league, and we're going to end up like this. So, coming out the half, I think we might hit a three, come out the half. And once we hit the first three, I'm like, all right, we got, we got our, sh- our legs up under us. Mm-hmm. I knew we was going to walk them down after we made our first, our first shot, and then – they couldn't hit a three. That was where they missed like 21 in a row or something. 27. 27, 27 yeah. in a row. And they had like some wide open yeah. ones. And some they were good like ones. front yeah. rim. I'm like. Good shooters. Good shots. It was just meant for us to go to the finals. It was nuts. I felt that way. We all have our favorite go-tos, right? Shirts, sweaters, jeans, the stuff you wear all the time. But what actually makes them your go-tos? The answer is simple. Comfort and style. Well, I was getting dressed this morning and realized almost all of my go-tos are from Buck Mason. Buck Mason's clothes are second to none because they're timeless and never go out of style. Everything I get fits great right out of the box and quickly becomes my new favorite. Buck Mason makes all the essentials, jeans, shirts, jackets, and so much more. The curved hem tee is awesome. GQ calls it the best t-shirt in the game. And even after wearing them and putting them through wash after wash, they look just as good as when I first wore them. Yeah, Tommy, they just fit great and feel amazing, perfect for going out or lounging around. Trust me, once you try Buck Mason, they'll become your go-tos as well. So head over to buckmason.com slash JJ and get a free t-shirt with your first order. I said that right. It's a free t-shirt with your first order. That's B-U-C-K-M-A-S-O-N dot com slash JJ, buckmason.com slash JJ to get a free t-shirt with your first order. Hey y'all, don't let aches and pains keep you away from your fitness goals. New Plus CBD Pain Relief Topicals soothe sore muscles and joints so you power through your workout and bounce back faster between sessions. I myself know all too well how aches and pains can slow you down and the Sport Recovery Stick has really helped my body feel great and respond exactly the way it should. Plus CBD Pain Relief Topicals feature a potent blend of CBD and menthol and camphor to keep you pain-free and performing at your best. It doesn't matter if you're competing at the highest level or just trying to stay fit, the Plus CBD Sport Recovery Stick and Penetrating Pain Cream are the perfect complements to your training routine. All Plus CBD products are third-party tested and fully traceable from seed to shelf. That's a big reason why they're the number one selling natural hemp extract in the US. And don't forget, Plus CBD also offers sleep gummies to help make restless nights a thing of the past among several other products. So make the right choice. Shop now at pluscbdoil.com and enter promo code JJ for 40% off your first order. That's pluscbdoil.com, promo code JJ, 40% off. Do it. I want to get into media with you. 
where we have you've mentioned a bunch of your TV hits and stuff. And I always joke with him, this dynamic of a former player up, up there saying, yo, these guys suck and here's why. <laughs> <laughs> but you got into it early. You 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 were potting real early. I, I think you're the pioneer there. I don't know if you take credit, but I, I think you are as best I know. The first active guy, baby. Whatever. Yeah, you know, hey. Whatever. <laughs> revolutionized <laughs> the industry, go, no big deal. Himself, definitely, take, definitely takes credit. <laughs> <laughs> as you said, was, was media always the plan for you or did somewhere it develop to like, Yo, this is this is nah, this is a lane for me. I, I I actually I actually didn't really start the podcast because I was like I'm gonna have a career in media. I, I started it because I was curious if I could do something besides basketball. It was just simple, and then it was like then it became like oh I'll get some reps. I did a couple you know countdown hits when I played for the Clippers. Like do I like it? Um, and then I just honestly I you know Tommy and I met met, met at the Ringer. Uh, and we we launched, you know, we, you know, he brought it, came as a co-host my last year with the Ringer. I did three years with the Ringer, and then we launched the Old Man and Three. But like, I don't know if my life is going to be in media. Like, I it, I'm just open to things, yeah. and I like what I'm doing right now. It's like when I was playing, I had the greatest job in the world. It was my dream to play in the NBA, and then you know this this has just been fun. It's been rewarding and. I like doing it. I got. I'm gonna ask him why. Like, why the fuck do you have a podcast? Like, you're Kevin Durant, bro. <laughs> like I said, man, I, I just like talk about the game. I just like talking, to be honest. Yeah. Just like you, man. Shit, do you want to? Got so much knowledge and info. You wouldn't mind just sharing it. You know, it's simple. You know, so. I think part of the appeal of the podcast too in current media space, and, and granted, dude, like, I, yeah, I fucking I work at ESPN sometimes, but like. This really is what like the meat is. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. We when we can really talk hoops with like, there's no commercial breaks here, man. Just there's right. no. How there's long no, are we in? Yeah. We're at least an hour in. And just, <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. Shit. yeah. yeah. It's just a conversation about basketball, about memories, stories, whatever connections. Um, like and, and like you know, people that watch this or listen to this will be like, like Kevin and I were never teammates, but like there's a mutual respect there, yeah. mm -hmm. and like. A lot of guys I have on, I, we 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 have on. We we don't we don't know the guy before we even have him on. Yeah. But like they want to come on the show, we want to have him on the show. There's an inherent respect. There's you know peer to peer. So having conversations like that is man, it's fun. It's yeah. enjoyable. Yeah. And like like what we were talking about earlier, like I love basketball. I I knew I loved basketball when I played. I didn't realize how much I loved it till I retired. Really, really, yeah. Why do you think that is? I I don't know. Like. I remember when I retired, I was like, man, I'm not really going to watch the NBA this year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not going to really watch the NBA. And then uh, I booked I booked a, a golf trip first week of the NBA season. And I, I played. Just to get away from. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah, just because I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to watch opening night. No, no, no. I'm going to book this golf trip. So I, I went and played golf. And then I got back. And that's when ESPN was like, do you want to come work for us? And I was like, oh, yeah, whatever. So. Then I was like, I'm going to work Tuesday. So I was like, I got to watch, I got to watch the game Monday night, you know? And then I'm, I'm like, all right, I watched the game Monday night. And then like Tuesday turned into Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And all of a sudden I'm like, I'm fuck, I'm back on it. Like if the TV's on in my house, it's basketball. It doesn't matter. Like I've yeah, like watched a relationship. I've, yeah, I've, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> I've watched more oh college basketball. <laughs> almost dumped her, but he's back. <laughs> you know, women's college basketball, men's college basketball, NBA. Like if it's there's basketball fun, on the television, man, I'm just, fucking watch. I don't care what it is. We were watching McDonald's all American. Like <laughs> yeah. coming from the game, get to the house, put a game on, watching. I, I wanted to ask you guys about. We we talk about this all the time with different guys. So like, who do you like watching in the league right now? I was wondering, saying, would you like? Do you have rooting interests? You know? Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name the guys that I'm super tight with. Like, I like watching CP play, but like, like the guy for me right now is Book. I love watching Book. Play. <laughs> I was gonna say beautiful book. game, like, beautiful game. I was gonna say Book too. I mean, he just this is a pretty game for one, but I I, I just think he's really mastering who he is right now. He's figuring it out, like. How to play at an elite level, but are still win, because he's he always was scoring the ball, but he knows how to win. For me, it's Kyrie. Um, when he came back, did you remember what I texted you when he came back? Yeah, I mean, he's like you said, he's just in his other planet, his other <laughs> yeah. world. Like I reserve yeah. time to watch that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, who, exactly. Who else is on that? Who else is on that level? Take yourself out of it. Who else is on that level where you're like, okay, they operate differently. They operate in a different like tier than everybody else. Uh, Joel. For sure. It's he doesn't make sense. It's ridiculous what he can do. Uh, I think Giannis is in that tier. 
Um, especially when he making the turnarounds in the post. Like he made one last night. Yeah, we was bugging. We saw yeah, that. yeah. Like when he's making <laughs> shots like that, it's just. And then I think Bron Bron was reached that tier for me this year. It's, the shot making was been yeah, incredible ridiculous. this season. I mean, then I mean, shit, there's so many dudes, bro. I can't. I I just like watching. I, I like shot makers, and I feel like now in our league, it's so many great shot makers, and it might not be the superstar players, but it's some like Reggie Jackson to me has been making some amazing shots this year. Mm-hmm. Like guys yeah. like that have been yeah. playing well. Like yeah. fucking Sadiq Bay had 50 in the shots that he yeah, was making. Was he was shooting that. fadeaways yeah. in the post and fall away threes. I'm just like, I, I just love to see that shit. You know, I, the thing about Giannis. That's, I'm glad you brought him up because for a guy that people like knock his skill mm-hmm. because he doesn't shoot threes at a high clip or whatever. And by the way, his mid-range field goal percentage has gone up literally every year in his career. He's shooting 42% from the mid-range this year, which is well above league average. Way better than what he was before. Ooh, yeah, low 30s. <laughs> low 30s. But like he he's another guy – when you talk about like somebody mastering who they are, like he mm-hmm. he's just on his way every year, just mastering more and more and more. But the thing I like about him, and this is why I like watching him, is like we all, we would be like, all right, guys, it's time to turn up. Like Giannis, you don't need to tell him that. Yeah. Like did you, the the skills competition <laughs> at All Star break, <laughs> he's on like he he all goes the time. yeah he goes a hundred out of a hundred all the time. There's yeah. a physicality. And that, by the way, that is a skill. Yeah. Like being yeah. able to do that every night, a motor like that, and yeah. and. The, the thing that impressed me, not, and I knew this about him, and I suspected this would happen, this guy wins two MVPs in a row. The following year, wins an NBA Finals. Is MVP of the Finals, has 50 in game six in the closeout game. Short offseason, comes out looking for blood. Mm-hmm. Like, he started the season so well. Where a lot of guys with a short offseason – Probably would have taken it easy. Probably would have taken it game, games off, and he just came out like, yeah, like Giannis, yeah. hundred out of a hundred. Yeah, a short off season though is beneficial though, in my opinion. Think so? Yeah. Why? Because you don't get much of a break. Your mind is just still in game mode. I feel like like three months off and just totally your mind is not even focused on a game or preparing for a game. That's just a totally different world to me because I know how to like shut it off where I don't worry about basketball at all. Those two mindsets are just two different things. But when you stay locked in, even if you don't get up on your feet to play, you're still really in it, in my opinion. What does what does shutting it off for Kevin Durant? What does that look like? Like before I go to sleep, not worry about anything. Like the next day, like what I'll do when I work out, like what shots I'll take in my workout, or what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Wait, do you do you really do that? Like the night before, so like Just in like off throughout in the off day. season, do you think about your next day's workout the day before and what you're gonna work on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what I'm going, what I'm gonna yeah. go through. I just like to get prepared, so you're visualizing. There's no, yeah, no surprises. Like if I'm gonna go, if I'm gonna shoot fifty shots from seven um, spots on the floor, then I, I want to get ready for that. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to just be surprised now that I, when I go into the gym. So I like to kind of yeah, mentally like, you know. And I don't want to write things down too much that it would be too you know. I, yeah, I, I would go I, I would go into I would go into even in, even in season I would, I would go into workouts with like a purpose. So like on a Monday I'd say, "Oh, you know, what did I do? What did I do on Friday?" Oh, you know, I did a lot of catch and shoot stuff. All right, today's going to be DHOs and, you know, you know, one dribble pick yeah. and roll shots. And I work on that. But like I would I I would go like if we lost on Friday in the playoffs, I go back in the gym Monday and I but those days in between I would write out my entire summer schedule. <laughs> and I would take breaks. Like I would take like I, I needed to turn off a little bit. So I would just take, you. But I would is there like a coach or I would take you? four day breaks. I you know, I go Thursday to Sunday I'd get away. Or I'd 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 July fourth weekend, I'm not doing shit. You know what yeah. I mean? But like every other day throughout the summer, like I knew where I was gonna be at ten AM. This explains the getting mad about not having lunch at two fourteen every game day. Were, were you one of those guys who get, get frustrated at themselves when they miss missing shots in a workout? Oh yeah, like cursing yourself out. You, but you probably. I mean, yeah, I do that. But I, it, it came to a certain point. I had to stop. I, I got. I had to correct myself when I do shit like that. Really. Yeah, because I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk to myself that way, <laughs> you know. <laughs> the refs is cool, but you, no. yeah, I, I just had to. 
because the next shot is important though, and, mm. and 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 I've always felt myself thinking about last shot, the last shot sometimes, and when I'm scream fuck or pissed off like that, it can bleed over into the next shot, and I realized that, and I was like, hold, on, I gotta maybe I gotta chill and. On how to talk to myself. So I wondered if other players thought like that. Missing a jumper for you must feel like acid in your eyes. Because I hate it. In the workout by myself, I don't feel like. Yeah. Somebody told me that if you shoot 50% in a workout by yourself, then you're not a good shooter. Like, I feel like I should be making 90% of my shots. Yeah. So if I, mean, I for, miss, yeah. I'm pissed. I, yeah. I, I, I think like an average workout for me in the offseason, I'm shooting 80%. And I'm, I'm like shooting game shots. I'm not. This is not yeah. spot shots. I'm yeah. Spot shots. I'm Smooth, shooting higher yeah. than that. I'm saying like game speed. I'm coming off a DHO. I'm getting to my right hand. I'm taking a step back. You know, I'm like, I'm doing that for an hour, and I might take 300, 400 shots, and at that game speed, and I'm like, I'll, I'll shoot 80. percent That's an average workout for me. But there are days like you shoot 70, percent and I would leave the gym, and, and I, man, I'm down on myself. <laughs> bro. Yo, I'm down on myself, <laughs> and it's a fucking workout in July. It doesn't matter. Yo, I remember because uh, I was going through my Achilles. I had a lot of those days yeah. where, like, I felt my jumper felt good, and then it would feel a little off here. And then I went. On, I remember I went on a break for my birthday. I was in Cabo, and I swear I didn't have a good time because I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> like I can't believe like what is going on with me. Basically, like. I'm shooting the shit left. I'm going right. I was really thinking about this, and, and and I had to. It's like questions you ask yourself: like, am I too involved in this shit right now? Like, where I can't I'm too invested in this life. <laughs> yeah, and it's well, especially it's, after everything you've accomplished, you know, because you're not just starting out. It's like you're having those thoughts after multiple championships, multiple final MVPs, everything like that. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was stressful. We can, we can we can wrap up, but to that point, like I. I'm I'm actually very curious the mindset when you tore your Achilles. Did you go through the self pity? <clears throat> no. You always had that that like hearing you talk about this. I understand now why you have been so good coming off this injury because there it seems like there was a point to prove not 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 just to everybody else but like to yourself like yeah. I can get back yeah, yeah, yeah. to being me yeah for sure fuck this I'm doing this yeah yeah I mean I early on when I first did it I was just I, I did ask myself should I made a different decision going out there and play like and then after three or four times I'm asking myself like what good is that gonna do like so I moved past it pretty quick um but I knew it was going to be a struggle coming back. Like, I just didn't, the uncertainty of how I was going to play was just fucking with me. Like, every day, like, watching games, like, could I pull up on a break like that? Like, can I still get to the rim and jump off my right leg like that? Like, and I just wanted to try it out. So when, like, you can't try it, like, I couldn't even run, you know? So I was still doing calf raises, but in my mind, I wanted to see if I could fucking dunk or shoot a fadeaway. You know what I'm saying? Like, so <laughs> knowing that I couldn't even get in the gym for four months, that was just driving me crazy. So, but once I actually got a chance to, like, test it out, then that's when it went just downhill. Everything was better, but. But until you could test it, and it that anxiety was just oh, there all God. the time. But then, Can I do it? Can I, I do it? that would yeah. stop. Once I start getting into the gym, working out individually, and then playing pickup, but once it's like, all right, I need to see what it's like in a real NBA mm -hmm. game, you know. Yeah. And then once I did that in preseason, I'm like, all right, I need to see what playoff – like, it was just so much going on. I just wanted to get back to a point. So that's why I said in that Milwaukee series, it's yeah. like, all right, that was the final – Yeah. That was just the last stage of me, you know, getting over that. That makes mentally. sense. I met him as he's recovering, um, and that's when we kind of got tight. And I remember going over there – and it was the first day you could jump and run. Yeah, it was an exciting day. And he was like like a kid in a music choir. He was just excited that he got to play basketball again. Nice. And so it was – I was like, oh, this shit is real. And then just slowly, gradually getting there. And then, did you ever – that season in the bubble, you never considered playing at all in that season? Because I didn't feel right. I didn't feel like I can do certain things. Like I can – be a decoy out there. I felt like I can maybe make be a you, few though. shots, but I wasn't like commanding the game like I can now, you know. So I wasn't gonna do it regardless. It's true love, Kevin. Basketball. Well, fellas, this has been awesome. It's nah, been great. This, this has been awesome, man. Thanks. Yeah. Been a fan of the show forever. Guys, this is the first we'll do this yeah. Again. yeah. We got to. This is this is the OG crossover. There it is. <laughs>